Okay, go ahead, uh, yeah, Gary. Yeah. I was just, uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so I think today's archetype is probably my favorite. And I've, and I've got to tell you, because I know in, uh, in the dream group, Zin, she had this dream and it involves some of the tarot cards. And, and they were actually ones I knew, but I didn't know them from the tarot. I knew them from this Jungian book that, you know, does the Jungian take on them. And, you know, Zin just kind of looked me like, at me like I was off my rocker when I was doing the comparison, because apparently the tarot and the Jungian interpretation don't line up at all. <laughs> so just be aware that, you know, if you know the tarot, that, you know, what I have to say is going to be coming uh, from, you know, this, this woman's Jungian interpretation. And, you know, she, she's got all the, the credentials and, you know, it all seems, all seemed really good to me, but it doesn't Spe align. Speaking to the psyche, really, you know, rather yeah. than predicting uh, outer events, probably. Right, right. It's all, it, it all has to do with symbolism, exactly. Good point. So today's is the uh, magician. And magic is uh, sometimes called the science of hidden relationships. And the essence of this art is uh, revelation. The magic represents a wonder working part of ourselves, which can divine the hidden wellsprings of life and open them for creative use. So contrasting this with the fool, the fool is a happy-go-lucky amateur. The magician is a serious professional. The fool is a loner. The magician will include us in his plans. The fool perpetrates his surprises behind our backs. The magician can perform his magic before our eyes. The fool is a happy-go-lucky amateur. The magician is a serious professional. With the fool, the impulse is deep in the unconscious. That sets us on a quest. The magician directs this energy. It is a conscious uh, process. So according to Jung, all magic, miracles, and parapsychological happenings have one ingredient in common, an attitude of hopeful expectancy on the part of the participants. The other half of this is awareness and dedication. These two poles have equal importance. Without both factors, the flow, the magic cannot take place. For our quest in uh, individuation, you can make this a little bit more down to earth. The expectancy is a prediction which is based on our knowledge and connection to our work. But just like the magician, we have to do our exercises for the prediction, the expectancy to have any meaning. So I expect if I do dream work that, you know, that I'll understand the unconscious archetypes and archetypes better. I expect that if I do active imagination, that I'll connect in new ways to my inner figures. And I expect that if I do yoga nidra and the Qigong, that I will push the spiritual into the physical. One of the important steps in Jung's equation for the realization of God or the self. In Craig's presentations, we gain knowledge and we see connections <clears throat> that we did not see before. But none of this means very much unless we actually exercise this knowledge. This uh, It's only doing half the work, so the flow never begins. It's the equivalent of taking a physics class and memorizing the formulas, but never exercising them to do the computations and the predictions. We can be the fool without doing the work, which is not a bad thing, there's still gains. In this group, we all have the archetype, or you know, we all have it as one of our archetypes would be a better way to put it, of the magician. 
So I don't have to list the examples of the magician. We all seek to become whole, to, to go down and through, and to become more conscious. Just remember there are two parts to this, the knowledge and the exercising of that knowledge, which creates the flow, which is the alchemical work of making the stone. And for those of you that are curious, I added a section to that uh, Aeon paper that talks about quantum theory and has a magical yet scientific explanation about how when we view the world through a particular lens that is well-defined and well-grounded, our expectation, our prediction of the outcome can actually create an entanglement between the observer and the observed that creates the predicted outcome. And you know, what could become what could be more of a magician than that? <laughs> um, so that's that's it for today's archetype, unless you have any any questions on this. Wonderful. Uh, you know, what Jung said was that what the ancients call magic, moderns call psyche. So, uh, you know, what the magician really is, is this uh, master of, of the inner world, you know, and this magic, which happens, this synchronistic uh, events, you know, is magic. A event in the outer world uh, and the event in the inner world uh, are, are uh, united. And, uh, you, you know, you, you were talking about the physics aspect to, of it, but there's another aspect. To me, uh, uh, what I always think of it as is that you study a cookbook, but you never cook. You never oh, Yeah, that's food. a really good analogy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, you, you know, it's just, um, and, and that, uh, yeah, it's just uh, a wonderful image. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the idea is too, in that uh, you mentioned the quantum leap, you know, uh, the, the idea is this, you know, I, uh, you know, you know, when I, I go into the inner world, you know, uh, uh, I can't carry the burden of ego. So, I mean, it's, it, it, and it's inflations because it totally snuffs out any, uh, any permeable uh, contents coming up. So I have to carry my own skull with me, my death skull, you know, so I can go down into the depths. And then that, that helps me to keep this inflation aspect of my away. And then when I get, I get to the edge of a, of a bay and on the other side of the bay lies um, uh, all, uh, all, um, all potential and latent contents that created life uh, before it was even it, there was life, and and the only way you can get there is through a quantum leap. And you ask the the goddess who sits there, who's this woodpecker mother, you know, you ask her, um, why do you live here at this uh, edge of the uh, uh, of this bay, and uh, she. This is the center. This is the the edge, the limit. You know, the the idea of of uh, Jungian psychology is is it is a borderline psychology. It's one where the the dream or the you try to take the center of gravity of consciousness to the to this uh, place where the quantum leap can, can take place. But anyway. It's, that's, let's just keep going. And then when you get through them, let's start them again. You know, because I think- um, Oh, you know, I had, I had one other thing that I wanted to mention, and maybe this will make a little more sense to people, you know, when we get a little farther along. But I, I think, you know, the main reason for going through these archetypes is that, you know, so that we can kind of see them in our own life. So if they come up in an unconscious form, and you can disagree, but you know, I believe that mostly means they're coming up as as complexes. Uh, and so it'll probably be, you know, within their negative aspects. Um, and then, you know, if, but if like, okay, so I heard of this therapist and this therapist said, look, sometimes I have to create a little bit of separation from my client. And 
when I need that, I assume, you know, the archetype, I think he set up the healer. And that way, you know, I could avoid some of the transference and I could, you know, give reasonable advice. So what I, I guess what I'm saying is I think that the more conscious that we can become, the more that we can name these things that, you know, that that's where this becomes useful. So my request is this, if people see an archetype coming up in their own life, that they think was like, oh, this was an interesting experience, you know, whether it's a good art, you know, on the negative or positive side, then instead of like, you know, me giving my little presentation, like, you know, and I'll, next time I'll ask, I'll say like, hey, did anybody have an experience? And if you did, go ahead and talk about it. Because, you know, I think it, it's just like the fairy tales. I think when these things become real in someone's life and when we can see, when we can really see these things and feel it and, and, and you know, within the group that, you know, that really makes it alive and interesting. And, and, and it's that process of making it alive that's so helpful. Then you understand, you just don't know. I mean, this is the idea, the difference between explaining and knowing and understanding and uh, having it be a part of, uh, of, of being able. I mean, they're, they're two totally different uh, things. The explanation doesn't contain experience. The understanding does contain the experience. So sit and reading about... Uh, uh, these type of, of experiences and not actually having it happen are, are you know, like uh, reading about uh, food, but never eating it. You know, the, uh, you, know, you know, one thing I've experienced, and this has been very recent, you know, is uh, one thing Solzhenitsyn used to say, you know, it's true when it happens to you, you know, I, I really now am feeling such gratitude that something that me, I am really experiencing this in, in having it happen to me and it's coming in and it, it, it never did come in before, but it, now it has started, you know, and it happens to me. And so I, I really feel like for the first time in my life that there's a me here, you know. Uh, because there's events occurring, you know. Well, anyway, uh, hi, uh, Dahlia and, um, and uh, Angelique and Tim uh, and Diane came in and now uh, um, Azeen, yes. And I, and I got Ava hi. too. Hi. Yeah, hi. I, got I just wanted to let you know that I'm just going to be listening today because my grandchildren are here. Okay, great, Diane. All right, thanks. Yeah, we'd like to Bye. have you anyway. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to uh, start up with this um, wonderful uh, uh, fairy tale again of Vasilisa the Beautiful. And it, it's so interesting, um, you know, that these progression of fairy tales that she's done. Now, this one here um, is um, totally takes place in the feminine realm. And it is the story of what happens to the feminine uh, psyche when the mother dies and when she needs to now become her own uh, uh, she, to, she needs to um, she's confronted with the task of finding uh, femininity in her own form not in, in the collective form but in her own form and uh, it's, the, the figures in it are very very interesting um, you have uh, the the uh, stepmother and we'll find out about her and her two stepsisters and then you have uh baba yaga which means like grandmother screech or something you know it's just this uh she she's she is the is the fourth character the fourth feminine figure in this quartet of feminine figures the the three uh the stepmother and these two stepsisters represent a kind of a collective consciousness uh, the, it, that's in its death throes, okay? And then the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Baba Yaga represents this um, uh, uh, you know, uh, psychic quality, 
which also needs to be pre present there, also needs to be overcome. And then she has three riders. She has three masculine riders. So she's sort of at the midpoint of, a, of two quaternities. She's at the midpoint of this a quaternity with the collective, and she's at the midpoint of the quaternity with, with the uh, unconscious, you know. Uh, and so there's two. So anyway, the, uh, this daughter is, um, her mother dies. And this was something, Ang Angelique, that was very interesting, is she's left, you know, she's lost the projection of the mother, but she's left the, uh, the, the, the qualities of the mother in this uh, doll that she's going to take with her now, you know, almost like uh, um, Aquarius is going to take his vessel of, of water with him wherever he goes. She's, she's taking the, um, the essence of the mother archetype with her wherever she goes, but it's not um, projected anymore. So it's an inter inner character, not something that's outside here. It's something that she carries with her. So anyway, the task um, that uh, she's, she's asked to go through is very difficult. And this whole uh, fairy tale is going to describe the difficulty of it in just such a beautiful and profound fashion. I don't think you're gonna find the concept she mentions here anywhere else, anywhere. Anyway, um, the, 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 the difficulty is now here is not dealing with the negative animus or uh, anything in the masculine world. It is, the, um, it is uh, separating some, them, some oneself from the archaic mother-daughter identity. And, and then what happens after that happens? Because there's a great, uh, uh, you get attacked when that happens by the uh, by those forces of, of this participation mystique that you had with the mother. So when she does this, when Vasilisa's mother dies, she and when anyone's mother dies, they're confronted with their own current psychic weakness in its initial stages. So uh, and, and uh, so the, this is the great problem is this. Um, is finding uh, your femininity, femininity in its your own form. It's the great problem in fem feminine psychology, because women uh, more than men. This is from Ron Franz. Uh, tend to identify with their own sex. They um, they can remain in this archaic uh, identity. Um, uh, the, you know, following the herd, and every all of us follow the herd. So this is just speaking of the particular way that a woman follows her herd, you know, copying hairstyles, the ways of talking, acting, uh, like a member of a flock, all of the same type. This participation mystique with her herd has this great impact on her when she's growing up. And, uh, and through eros and relationship, uh, they're all identical with each other and swim together. And uh, so this is, this is the problem of finding her femininity in her own form, what M Marian Woodman calls conscious femininity. And so now the, the doll um, is not just uh, the child's fantasy of having children, it's something much more profound. It is an object which contains the divinity. The, the, uh, this is the awakening here. She's given an object which contains the divinity in this doll. It's no longer the physical mother, it's, it's the divine mother, the one that created her uh, uh, in all life. And uh, many children can't sleep without blankets, blankets or teddy bears or some fetish which has to be in a certain place. Otherwise, they can't sleep and are exposed to the dangers of the night. So it's not the child's child yet, but the child's God. And these fetishes appear in children and, and religions and are symbols of the self. And it re represents to one in a religion or to a child, 
the secret of eternity and the uniqueness of each human vessel contains, and it contains the, the uh, secret essence of the life of this individual human being. This, uh, uh, this thing that she carries around with her like Aquarius. She, she carries the projection of the self with her. The magic object or the essence on which uh, the life of uh, uh, the child and our lives depend, by which it finds its own essence uh, and only, uh, so this archaic identity between the mother daughter is, is the unconscious foundation from which the individuation of both begins. In the case of the daughter, when the mother dies, she has this vessel of the mother like that she carries around like Aquarius. In the case of the mother um, who has identified with being a mother, she now needs to uh, go into the second half of life get to her own work and creativity. And the fact that she can't, she doesn't know why. Uh, the daughter's grown, but there's still sand in the machinery. Now she gives this wonderful uh, dream. Uh, now remember, I think what the, the, the whole thing here is about the uh, separation of the daughter from the collective uh, herd of, of, of femininity, the collective consciousness of, of the feminine. It needs, the, the, the daughter needs to separate herself from the collective consciousness of the feminine, which is represented by the herd of, of, of the feminine and the mother that she had a, a, a archaic identity with. But the dream is there, uh, this woman saw uh, who was having this problem. She, she couldn't start her second half of life. Her daughter had grown, but she couldn't start. So she had a dream that there was a big potato with a smaller one attached to it. And at the joint between the two, two rose a staff which had a crucified snake wrapped around it. A, it was a winged snake wearing a crown on its head which emitted light. So it was this tree of life symbol and was a very impressive. But at its root of this divine engine, image, at the root of the divine image, there were just these two potatoes in the earth. And uh, um, so according to the dream, something is not right. The potatoes are still in the earth. They're still attached to each other. And even though the tree of life is growing impatiently, the process of individuation is developing in a bad spot. You know, she can't separate from, from, from her own unconscious identity with uh, the archaic uh, mother-daughter uh, relationship. And, you know, and then, um, uh, you know, find her own femininity, find femininity, femininity in her own form. So it's a, uh, the, the bad spot is a place of evil where everything is bound up and the borders have not been uh, made clear. Now this is, a, it's a, just showing this basic archaic identity that only a superhuman effort uh, can be made to separate, you know, and uh, only then can she become conscious of her own personality, but she must take back all those projections and become individual herself. It's a very difficult task. And, um, uh, she says, we hear of mothers devouring their sons, but in some cases, even worse when they are bound up with their daughter. And uh, so, <clears throat> so the, 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 since the daughter represents the self for the mother, somehow this daughter, this physical daughter, uh, is the doll, you know, that represents the self, even though it's not a doll anymore. Now it's a real girl. It has become her doll and she can't separate it from it. So then the daughter moves away. She doesn't really realize that the self is within her. It's not projected onto the doll or to the daughter. You know, so the doll and the daughter are somewhat similar. On So it's this, the, the, this uh, ar archaic mother-daughter identity is the foundation on which individuation begins for both. That's what she's saying. So 
The self in women's psychology, the self, the organizing or archetype of wholeness, which is different in every individual. It is your root and your rhizome, and it needs to uh, achieve its own form. Not his form, not her form, but your form. Not Jung's form, not Freud's form, but your form needs to come out in you, you know? And uh, um, for in, in the uh, woman, it is represented by either the wise old woman or this uh, younger uh, aspect. And for men, it's the Senex and the Poer, you know, the godfather, the godson, the father, the oldest and the youngest. So it's this, uh, the image of the eternally old or the eternally young uh, has to do with the timelessness of the self, the fact that it doesn't exist in time, you know. And uh, uh, so in this case, where the self is our daughter, um, the, it, it represents a, a newly discovered consciousness within her. And uh, um, so uh, if the self appears as a young person in a woman's unconscious it, uh, images, it means this newly discovered, newly consciously discovered self. And then the self is our daughter, not the wise old woman. But insofar as the self was always uh, within the mother's, the self is also your mother and it existed long before ego consciousness. So there's, a, there's both, both the wise old woman and this daughter who's the newly discovered one or uh, the self for the woman. And uh, so um, the, this is why the self like uh, is represented uh, by the uh, mother and daughter and feminine psychology. I think the idea is that um, we develop, um, uh, you, you know, so the self in, in, the, in, a, in someone who's born male is a seed or a root that develops in, the me, in, in, the, in that direction where the seed or the root, uh, the organizing archetype of wholeness, the self in the woman, it tends to that other direction. And uh, of course, there's variations on that uh, uh, spectrum. So the moment Vasilisa receives the magic doll from the dying mother, instead of being identical with the mother, she begins to realize the seeds of her own personality. So the first hint of the self appears. And this usually does appear at eight, and that's when her mother dies. Now, uh, then, so then, um, you, even though you have the uh, image at eight of being unique and different from everyone else, um, you, you can't guess how it will take shape. It's, gonna, it's a long journey. And then we bring in the stepmother. So now she represents collective consciousness. The merchant marries this witch with two daughters. And uh, uh, they, they are all persecuting Vasilisa. So, and this is a recurring archetypal motif. Where the pearl is, where the treasure hard to attain is, where our individuation is, so also is the dragon and vice versa. They are never separated. Um, and this is, uh, exemplifies uh, the resentment of collective consciousness that that you've left the herd, you know, uh, it's uh, it, the it frequently just after the first realization of the self, this this attack occurs. Um, the this powers of desolation and darkness break in, uh, as in uh, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, you know, Herod slaughters all the children. And, and it's a really a symbol of the uh, uh, this persecuting power is collective unconscious, the collective consciousness objecting to you leaving it and becoming something that's never been seen before on land or sea. You leaving the participation mystique of, of this uh, uh, unconscious identity uh, with. Um, uh, a, a collective consciousness. Okay. The um, now uh, there's a, an outward 
so, so this uh, terrible slaughtering always takes place. Some persecuting power starts out at once and it wants to blot out that inner seed that is flowering for the first time. Outwardly, uh, the innermost kernel of the human being has an irritating effect on the collective, on collective consciousness, on the outer surrounding. Realization of the self when in a state of birth um, can make a person unadapted to con collective and uh, difficult for those around them. To, uh, it disturbs uh, the collective instinctive order. This, um, uh, and and, and um, the, uh, she says that often when you analyze a member of one member of a family, it makes the rest of its members wobble and get upset. And so as herd animals, we have in within us this essential conflict between the inertia to remain in the flock and this disturbing factor, this discovery of the self and, the, and the, our own seed and the, the fact that it needs to flower and the possibility of individuation. So the woman gets the first hint of, this, of self and she's immediately attacked by the stepsister and the stepmothers. And uh, uh, she's not only attacked by the outer stepmother, but by the inner stepmother, the inertia of the old collective pattern. This is what uh, inhibits us from growing and developing. This regressive inertia, which always pulls one back, invites us to do the thing in the least painful way. So now, uh, is, as a typical motif, uh, this is this is something you can take forward. And other stepsisters are lazy, because it is the heroine who's leaving the herd. It's her that has to do the tremendously hard work of of of, of resisting this regressive inertia, which wants to pull her back, and she does this through the sorting of seeds which requires a uh, supernatural assistance. So there's this conflict between uh, that which calls on you to make the superhuman effort and the desire to just remain in the old pattern. So um, the, now the stepmother, uh, she uh, moves to the woods after the father leaves the country. And uh, um, she is... Uh, uh, so, and, and this um, happens often um, uh, that, uh, we, we, well, she mentions that women without a strong animus tend to vegetate in an amazing way. They live 10 to 20 years like plants after the mother dies and uh, uh, without positive or negative drama at all, they just exist. So, and it's this, uh, um, sinking into the inertia of doing things the easy way, following the daily plan. There's no conflict, but there's no life either. So the stepmother wants to push Vasilis out and she wants her to be eaten by Baba Yaga, who lives in the forest in a clearing there. And she is this great mus magician who can turn herself into anything and, in, and in, into which the hero or heron, heroine um, are meant to be turned into pieces the size of poppy seeds. But in this uh, fairy tale, Baba Yaga is not completely evil, uh, it, except when she hears the daughter is the blessed daughter, she tells her to leave the house. So in a hidden way, she's not thoroughly evil and sometimes even helpful. She wondrously uh, portrays the great mother in her double aspect. Um, this, um, uh, the uh, Baba Yaga is, um, uh, well, she mentions this uh, story of the Tsar's son. I was going to leave it out, but the Tsar's son comes and uh, she says, my dear little child, are you here by your own free will or by compulsion? This is Baba Yaga's question. It's this great um, trick of the mother complex and of the collective consciousness in a man is to implant doubt in his mind, suggest that it might be better to do the other thing uh, or nothing at all, and thus laming him from any action. 
So, uh, and, and this hero in, in the male hero says, grandmother, you should not ask such questions. Now give me something to eat or else. And so Baba Yaga cooks him a dinner, gives him good advice and it works. So um, it depends on the hero's attitude toward her, how she responds. This is what happens to Vasilisa. Depends on her attitude towards Baba Yaga uh, and how she responds. Now she tries to make him infantile. She sees he is up to her and then she helps. So Baba Yaga can be good or bad. Uh, and this image of the feminine Godhead uh, is uh, like the feminine uh, God, male, the male Godhead uh, has this uh, dark side, a uh, dark and a light side. Now the Virgin Mary uh, is the light side of man's uh, uh, anima or the woman's self, uh, but she's completely unreal because um, she lacks shadow. She's all light. You know, this was something Jung uh, said in that wonderful, well, it's a, um, let me see if I can, yeah, she's, uh, you know, your uh, Christ, this is a letter from the letters, your Christ is all light and no darkness, while the self manifests in two colors, white and black. He cannot be identified. You, he cannot be identified with the whole self, the, the Christ, because but only with its light side. So he really isn't identified with nature. You know, he's more identified with the spiritual realms, uh, and it's a necessary evolution in in consciousness that this extremes between uh, uh, spirit and nature uh, occurred. That way, that way the ego uh, becomes much stronger in its self-will aspect. And then at, at some point when the, an antiodromia uh, recurs, now the, the unconscious and nature has a much more powerful vehicle one that is much less identified with its animal side. So the idea of, of this uh, all light being, you know, uh, creating this ego, which is uh, so far from nature, uh, allows in, 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 in thousands of years, this very uh, powerful uh, ego now to be the vessel of, of the depths. You know, so maybe in the age of uh, of Cap Capricorn, when when the goat fish, the one that lives on the top of the mountain and under the sea, uh, will have a very powerful vessel to to pull that off. You know, so um, anyway, Baba Yaga represents this uh, psychically more realistic um, form. And she's full of the power of destruction. Well, let's get uh, the two things I want to cover here are the um, uh, are the uh, mortar and pestle, and the uh, and and then the, we'll start on the seeds. So I'm I'm you know I always kind of have to skip some of the middle stuff, but we do want to mention that um, you know uh, Hecate uh, uh, that um, uh, that that. Um, Bob, Baba Yaga is divine, and she's a sort of um, this um, uh, is a uh, surviving remnant of the late antique he Hecate, the queen of the underworld. Uh, she was the goddess of Hades, and she became more and more identified with the Neoplatonic world soul, and as such became the feminine spirit of the universe, the goddess of nature, of life as well as death, the goddess of death. And yet she was also praised as the feminine savior of the world, Sotera, you know, uh, this goddess of death, goddess of life and death. And her daughter Persephone, uh, who with, she was secretly identified. Um, uh, her name, Vasilisa, comes from this Greek word, uh, Vasilisa, which means queen. Now, uh, I mentioned, a couple times ago that in Young's death vision, his doctor comes towards him in his, in his primal form of, of the Basileus 
a coast. Now, Kos is where uh, Asclepius comes from, the god of healing. And a Basileus of Kos would be a king of Kos. And that's how he comes towards him. Or, or well, Young is, is about ready to step into the stone uh, uh, room where all questions to all, or the answers to all questions will be uh, given to him. Uh, he says he must return. So anyway, uh, now we went to uh, that, that idea of, uh, of, uh, she's the goddess of uh, has three she, she has uh, keys to all three worlds and uh, like Hermes she's often called uh, she's almost often uh, um, combined with Hermes and called Hermecate you know it's a combination of Hermes and, and Hecate you know uh, so anyway let's uh, quickly I want to get to two parts before we leave or go to questions or discussion. The, the mortar and pestle, it's very important. She sits in a mortar, uh, Baba Yaga, and uh, she um, uh, steers with a pestle and uh, um, with a broom uh, as a witch, or broom, witch broom, she um, blots out all uh, traces of her movements. Now let's see if we can get a, a picture of this because it's it was sort of hard for me to, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> picture. Let me see if I can see it here. All right, there we go. Well, this is one picture of it, you know, the mortar and pestle. There's the pestle with which she stirs, and then her broom, which which she uh, blots out her uh, things. You know, uh, analysis is uh, comes from from that words of mortar and pestle, and it means to. Uh, analyze something means to, to bring uh, what lies below up to the surface with the pestle. You know, I mean, that's the idea of analysis to uh, uh, analyze something, analyze a chemical. So um, anyway, um, these mortar and vestal, ves mortar as the vessel is a feminine symbol. It is the, uh, the uh, vessel, uh, Mary was the vessel of grace. It's also identified with the grail bowl or uh, as a vessel. And so Baba Yaga has this round vessel in which substance are ground to powder. She sits in that vessel that serves to pulverize matter. And so in alchemy, the basic image is that at bottom, there is one basic material of which all the universe is built, okay? And in the psyche, there is one basic material in which all the psyche is built. How do we get there? What, how do we get to this prima materia? And it's, it's uh, um, by means of which one could get to the root of the phenomena of the universe and of consciousness. And the hunt for this basic material is always hunted, hunted um, uh, philosophers. It's God's own secret, the material with which reality is built. The basic material contains the divine secret. And in alchemy, this was represented by ashes, something that has been burnt down to nothing and can't be burnt anymore. You know, that's where they find the salamander. And it's the residue of burning. And then in the vessel of the mortar, they, uh, they, uh, Count, pulverize it into the dust. And then they have the primary, prima materia, most bellic, basic element of matter. Now, this is where it gets so beautiful. The, the, the verb, the Latin verb, um, grind is taro. And from that word comes the word contrition. And if you realize your sins, if you realize, um, you, you, you know, the idea of, uh, your inflation, I think more than anything else. I mean, if you realize your inflation, you feel remorse and are tentative. If you, uh, if, if you can, um, you know, hit bottom, let's say, you know, uh, there's this, um, at, where Young says one time in the Red Book, actually, that uh, you can't be fully human unless you've touched bottom, okay? 
and this is uh, uh, contrition. Uh, and so only you can only get to the bottom uh, if you've been annihilated by your sins. You are reduced to ashes. You are pulverized and in a state of contrition. It's the deepest state of remorse, and it has the highest merit. So by contrition, by being ground up to the basic material, you are healed. This is the idea of the night sea journey to think where you go through and you're cut up into pieces and then you're assembled again, you know, and Osiris cut up into pieces, assembled again. You know, it, it's a realization of the shadow that goes so deep that one can say nothing more in one's favor. If you uh, had this uh, type of, of contrition, uh, a genuine contrition and a genuine grinding is what it's really saying. If you genuinely, genuinely been ground up. And, and, but, and this is the advantage. As in all highly disagreeable situations, it has the advantage that uh, you are at the very bottom of the hole. You can't go any lower. You've fallen down to the bottom. Therefore, you are at the turning point. Okay, that's the turning point. It's nowhere else. So the only way you can get to the turning point, now this is the point uh, where uh, um, ego in its nev negative aspects has been pulverized and has reached the, now what is the negative aspects of ego? There's, uh, ego is never gonna go away. It's ego, you can't pulverize it. You can't get rid of it but its negative aspects can be pulverized and its negative aspects are selfish uh, willfulness, which have finally given in to the greater powers within, okay? And uh, uh, it, it's funny that she uses the term greater powers. You know, in AA, they always use the term higher power. And I was trying to think out, well, well what's the difference between higher power and greater power? You know, is that is one preferable? I, I, you know, that might be some a good thing to discuss. Baba Yaga has the so Baba Yaga is the one who owns the instrument of contrition, the pestle and mortar, and she can bring the human being uh, to its um, uh, its. Uh, uh, she is the one that can bring the human being face to face. She's the life power which can bring the human being face to face with its ultimate truth. That's the symbol of the mortar and pestle. She is ultimate truth. She is the one who accepts no, uh, none of this uh, 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 phoniness. And many people never in their entire lifetimes, I'd say almost all of us reach this place of ultimate truth. You, you know, it's also often people who have, have reached near death seem to have uh, had a taste of this. You only reach this stage of complete contrition when you face death. And she says that we are like corks. When God hasn't uh, put too much of a burden on us, we float on the surface. But when death approaches, people suddenly shut up. They finally sink down to that thing in them, which is more substantial and something away from the surface. And so on their deathbed, their expression changes. For the first time, they are quiet and you feel they are really themselves. And so this is the ultimate truth. All the fuss of ego has come to end, the, an end. So Baba Yaga is also the daemon of death. And is it she who brings about this ultimate contrition. She is the greatest alchemist who reduces everything superficial to its essence. Now, remember what she, <laughs> all of this talk, she is destructive. She, what, what needs to be died, what needs to be pulverized, you know, is this, um, this self, selfish willfulness, you know, um, uh, Anyela Yaffe says that uh, we have free will to this extent, she says, 
we can either we we can either live by the inner truth which which we were born or or we can rebel against it you know and that's your free will you can either be a guy be the be the collaborator of the truth with which you were born or you can rebel against it with selfish willfulness for egoistic purposes you know, egoistic purposes rather than being the empty vessel and the servant of the truth which which you were born you know there's a one the the idea there was two uh, roots of the word truth one was aletheia you know that was the absence of forgetting you know when you're born uh, <laughs> the soul has not forgotten anything but the ego has forgotten everything now the soul still has it in there, so you can go back to her and get this uh, 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 this this thing thing that you forgot. But the ego forgets everything, you know. Now the other aspect of truth is that which sprouts up from the earth of itself. Okay. Now what is that? It's an oak tree. It sprouts up from the earth of itself. You know. Uh, and uh, or it is a puppy which plays and chews and things you know it's just this genuine unfolding of of uh, what is is within you know and uh, so we are these this strange broken uh being which um is uh which need which has to rediscover it but through the rediscovery the, the this magician that gary talked about will appear and magic appears synchronistic events Come into the world. This is the whole ontological purpose of being broken, you know, is to be the vessel of the depths in the outer world and allow synchronicity to occur and for the God image to evolve and for this these new realizations, to continue, beautiful realizations to come forth into the world. Now, uh, the, the last part we'll, we'll do about, and we don't have very much time, but it's the sorting of the seeds. And uh, um, this is the idea of selecting good grains from bad grains, you know. Uh, and uh, it's the typical task in myth for the heroine, uh, separating the good from the bad grains is a work of patience. And uh, uh, it can only be done one seed at a time. And uh, this, uh, it comes from this Greek word krino, which means to discriminate. And that means to make a distinction between A and B. But it is a work of careful, detailed feeling judgments, okay? Feeling judgments. This is, this is the aspect of valuations and prioritizing uh, based on, uh, relatedness. This is the way of clarity for the feminine uh, uh, consciousness. It's not discrimination as done by the male logos and his thinking. When, he, when this la the latter being is confronted with chaos, with a lack of clarity, he says, let's find a mathematical formula. <laughs> and this is this bird's eye view of the logos principle. And it does not look at the details. It does not use feeling judgments. So how does Eros, how does the feminine find clarity? The feminine principle also has its, its way, own way of seeing clearly, but it, it does it in a different psychological way. But uh, by showing one by one, this is this and that is that, using valuing the feeling function. What is my highest priority? What is my soul's highest priority? What is the highest value and priority in the feeling realm? That's how she gets clarity, the feminine principle, not by mathematical formulas. For a woman, it is important to go into things in detail to see how and where misunderstanding began. Okay, now the, the idea is uh, for the, this masculine logos, it wants to know. It wants to understand. In, in the case of the clarity of the 
of, of clarity of the feminine principle, it doesn't want to so much explain or understand, it wants to be understood with clarity, you know? And uh, this is the idea of the sorting of the seeds. So mis and understandings begin because of this lack of clarity and only by sorting through the seeds, the, the grains, uh, can the grains be selected properly? Now, I, I just wanna mention really quickly this beautiful dream that, um, that a cat had just recently where she set the task of, of there's this divine food, it's chocolate, divine chocolates, kind of like taffy or chewing gum, but mixed up with it is pus, an infection that, you know, creates dead white uh, blood cells that makes this sort of a serum of white, you know, in, in the infected uh, tissue. So her task is to sort this infected. In fact, she finally finds the root of the infection where it's coming from. Now, there is a, a man there who, who in the whole dream has his back to her wearing a black robe and he's hooded. And while she's doing this, he says to her, what, and now you, Pat, tell me if I'm wrong, since for memory, he says, what are you doing? Yeah, right. can you can you add uh, some details I missed, Kat? Yeah, he says, "What are you doing?" And I I say, "I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this." Now, uh, <laughs> isn't that beautiful? I mean, is that not sorting the the uh, good seeds from the bad seeds? Isn't that that not the uh, the principle? Of, of feminine clarity, you know, of uh, uh, not, you don't need a map. He's the, the guy at the black robe with his back to her, never shows his face. He wants to use a mathematical formula, but, but I have to do this uh, is the thing. Well, anyway, <laughs> I think we, uh, that we got to the end of that part anyway, and we'll start on lecture 11 next time, but, uh, uh, let's just go around and, and uh, Gary, why don't you? Uh... Yeah, you know, bef before we start, I, I guess I, you know, I wanted to bring up that image of Yabba Dabba and she's standing in the, in the uh, pestle with the mortar. And, but as she goes along, she erases. So this grinding down to the essence, that makes sense. But when I think of her erasing the trail so that, you know, so that no, no mark, no trail would be left behind. I'm, I'm wondering, do you think of that as kind of making things unconscious or that, you know, if you get to the prima materia, nothing before even matters? Oh, you're a muted. Well, what Marie-Louise von Franz says there is a puzzling image. And, and she identifies it more with the witch than with nature, but she does say nature likes to hide its tracks. Now, mm -hmm. now we'll come up with this next time of, of why Baba Yaga does not ask about the three hands, you know, the three pairs of hands, because, and, and we kind of brought this up last time. And one of the things von Franz says is, is nature loves its deer and its gazelles and its rabbits, but it also loves its wolves and its tigers and its uh, lions, you know? And yes, there, <laughs> so, so you d don't ask about the uh, three pairs of hands. The idea of some aspects of nature need to be, uh, this, I would say what the, what the broom represents is when, when Baba Yaga tells Vasilisa, you uh, don't ask so many questions, it will make you old. Or, it, 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 you, you know, uh, the answers to questions will make you old. And then she doesn't ask about the three pair of hands. And uh, Baba Yaga says, you are wise not to ask about what happens inside the house. You know, 
I will I... stop asking questions then, and I will go on to no. the scene. <laughs> no, G Gary, I was curious to what you meant, actually. If you could uh, elaborate, what was your thought? Oh, my thought was that, yeah, you yeah. know, I, I thought, I thought, well, she has, you know, she has both kind of a positive and negative aspect, you know, she may eat you up. And so I looked at it and I thought, you know, I thought, well, if, if she's grinding you to your essence, but also erasing your trail, I mean, you're becoming more and more unconscious as this whole process is going on. And so, you know, it can certainly be a positive new beginnings, but it could just, it could be death. It, it, I think it, it, it'll come up in that idea of the questions. You, you know, let me tell you something Young said really very beautifully one time about uh, the anima and the animus, you know, which is, is very close to this. Um, uh, you, you know, someone asked him, why is it that the anima appears in so many artworks, in so many literary works, and in so much music, but you rarely find the animus there in these works. And uh, Young, Young said, uh, he said, the, now the listen to this, this is so beautiful. I don't know how he came up with this, right off the cuff. This is just something he came up. The anima very much enjoys sitting for her portrait. But the animus is a clever fox. He covers his tracks with his tail. You know, uh, the, the, I, this, this uh, legend that the fox uh, puts its tail close to the earth and brushes out its tracks as it runs uh, through the forest so no one can follow it, you know. But I think this idea is, uh, and, and it's a very good contrast to um, Parsifal who does not ask questions and then Baba Yaga tells, asks the, uh, the hero a question. He tells her she shouldn't ask questions. And then we got Vasilisa only asking about the riders, but not about the three pairs of hands. So uh, what is this mystery? I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, let's hear what other people think. Yeah, that was, I just love that. Um, do we have any other comments on that before we start? Just jump in. Um, yes, I am. I am thinking that um, um, the, the sacred feminine, when she appears, um, she may have a numinous quality, but she doesn't. She doesn't follow rational rules um, in in a logos way, so that if we systematically repeat the same steps, we can meet her again whenever we choose to. So she doesn't go by signs. So if you follow, if, if you follow her trail, it's not guaranteed you will meet her again. Um, so all the steps that have taken you to her once cannot necessarily be followed the second time. We see that in um, uh, Buddhist initiations of feminine deities. <laughs> Uh, their mandalas to be visualized, they are so complicated. And they have secret doorways and pathways that the yogi teachers instruct only the very advanced ones as to how to enter and how then to dismantle the mandalas. Um, so I, I receive that um, as a similar thing. Uh, don't ask too much because you are a approaching your death you bring your death closer because you know the more objectifying you do the more you lose the great goddess um, and if you try to find her through past experiences then again you might not be able to do that's my reading in that oh that was great Beautiful. i just Enjoy. love that wonderful i yeah. was thinking when you you know of them doing these beautiful mandalas uh, the Tibetan monks that take, you know, weeks and weeks and then whoosh, they blow them away, you know. We have a, a place that they, they do that downtown and it's just incredible to watch, you know. And so you know, it's in a, just a perfect venue for it too. I always go whenever they do it. Um, Azen, would you like to lead off? 
Um, yeah, just I was, um, when Angelica was talking, I remember um, Edinger, he talks about encounters with the self. And when it happens, you want to do it, uh, do the steps and get there. In fact, the only thing that we want in life is another encounter. And it doesn't happen. This makes you crazy, hopeless. And then I read that Edinger says, um, that's the ego that wants to create patterns and rules and Sharia, Sharia law, you know? But um, um, what happens with the self is that it happens, the encounters happens differently every time. It's alive. So that was really interesting what she said, Angelica. Never to be repeated, you know, I mean, it's always a, anything that is not new is dead. You know, life is a becoming thing. So we can't repeat it to be unique to repeat the patterns. Yeah, beautiful. And we certainly can't will it. Um, Aline. Yeah, I, I love this fairy tale and um, I just can't stop thinking about systems theory, you know, I don't know if Jung invented it or this um, physicist invented it before him or Foucault with his the beehive and postmodernism, I mean, and so on and so forth. I can't remember the origin of it, but Jung just makes me think about um, systems theory that if you like disturb an anthill or a family, it always reorganizes itself for the better. And so Family systems theory is very big in um, treatment of alcoholics, for instance, because you change one person in the family and the rest of the family organizes, has to organize themselves for the better. So as far as the ego getting pulverized um, in the pestle by the life force of Baba Yaga, that is to me the dark night of the soul. And so a child becoming, I became an orphan. So I I went my own way, you know, away from the way my sisters were and they tried to pull me back. And I'm like, no, uh, you know, I had to have individuate because maybe it wasn't a very good iteration at age 15, but you know, I had something to build on. And so I, I, I do love the mortar and pestle and everybody's input and explanations. So thank you. Oh, beautifully put. I'm loving what we're getting. How about you, Tim? Yeah, this is fascinating stuff. Um, one of the things that I think of in in context of erasing the tracks is a, a sort of uh, effect that I'm aware of that I I can never go back to see how uninformed I was in a previous period. So I always I always look at the past with my own sense of awareness and it's very very hard for me to see you know a few years ago uh i had a the 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 magnitude of my understanding was only at a certain level uh and it seems as though that's that's always progressing so every every time i go through a catastrophe and learn something new I can't go back and see what I learned. All I can do is, is be aware of how much I know now. Um, and I'm, I'm talking mostly about personal development that uh, like I'll go back and read my journal and I'm struggling with something and I'm think and my, my observation is how in the world could I have not seen that this is this is what's unfolding there? So there's this kind of obliviousness that accompanies growth. And that's what it makes me think of. Oh, and also, wow. when it comes to con contrition, that was a really good um, awareness for me. I got into a little bit of trouble for a drawing that I did recently that I entitled Contrition. And, and I thought I understood what, I, what it meant, but then looking at the definition, it, it seems as though 
the emphasis is on guilt. But Craig, your your description was was I thought really great in that it's a kind of humility that comes from having hit bottom and then uh, having to respond with your total authenticity. And that's a different thing than sort of uh, taking responsibility for some kind of guilty behavior. It's, it's being pitched into the center of life and responding with authenticity rather than with defense, it seems to me. So thanks for that. It is, I think that really is the genuine, the idea of contrition is to be genuine and not to be phony anymore. And I, I, I really like your idea too of the, uh, of, the uh, um, of, of going back and looking at old things, uh, uh, covering your tracks is is the it's the principle of you you don't want to put on a wet bathing suit you know uh, crawling back into a wet bathing suit is you you know it's just uncomfortable and uh, you know like i would i would always want to go back and redo things that had happened in my life and and uh, and the, you know what the 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 anima told me she says well maybe you can go back she says but i'm staying right here and the idea is, is that what is important is the Tao of this moment, not the Tao of, of moments in the past. And, and, you know, I was telling my wife, too, uh, uh, we were talking about personifying and depersonifying. And one thing Hillman says is that, um, you know, that uh, it, we personify everything. We personify things in the past. We personify people that we see, and uh, you know, it, it's it, we're seeing it not outside what's happening. We're seeing what happens inside from our memories and from uh, everything that has ever happened to us and everything we see. It awakens something in us. We don't just view it with our eyes, you know, and uh, you know, you know, people who who've never been able to see before, and they are given some operation and they can see. They can't see because the brain is not adapted to taking the image in yet. You know, it takes a long, long time to do that. But I think in our own case, when we see, we hear, we experience, um, it isn't, it, 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 it actually, something is happening inside of us. It's not just the experience objectively of what happened. Yeah, that was, that was great. Uh, Dahlia, you wanna go next? Um, no, I, today I'm not, uh, I, I don't, I enjoy listening. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Kat, you're up. Um, I'm sorry. Again, this is a, a really amazing story and there's so, there's so much energy and layers to it. It's just kind of like, I'd have to keep going over and over and over in it to, you know, get the get the full meaning as much as I can, if you sort of mean. But I love the picture that you showed, Craig, of the um, Baba Yaga in the portal mess um, pestle and mortar, and the the um, clearing away the tracks. Now, I have thought of initially the clearing away of the tracks is because you've been grounded, you've been reduced to a powder or ash or whatever, so then therefore there is a death. And to cover the tracks, um, because a part of you's died, so you can't go keep revisiting the past, you can't keep revisiting those tracks um, as such, because you're emerging and becoming something new and I think sometimes in some sort of therapies there is that sort of um perhaps um, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way but sometimes the regurgitation and repeating of traumatic things 
without moving on, if you see what I mean, just can do more harm than good. It kind of keeps you stuck in a, a, a place. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just me for now, but I, I just I just love the whole thing really. It's just an amazing story. Thank, thank you. Yeah, beautiful. I, I love it, you know, especially the part of because you're grounded, you know, there's a part that's now gone. Um, Eva, do you have a, a comment? Yes, I'm sitting here thinking about, I read uh, Clarissa Pinkola Estes uh, version of this Baba Yaga story uh, almost 20 years ago. <laughs> and, and it's so interesting to, to get piece by piece into understanding or maybe even uh, some kind of integration. I, I can in integrate, what is it? Take it deeper and deeper and uh, especially this uh, pointing out this uh, mortal and the pestle and it was so clarifying. And, uh, and I'm just uh, into uh, wonder <laughs> about how, um, how long time it must take also for other people to get into this, uh, to take these fairy tales into active imagination or, or take it close to your own experience. And um, I was participating in uh, the Ullman group, the English Ullman group in London, from London. And um, then I was associating to, to my own dreams and no one understood what I said. They, they haven't read any fairy tales and uh, uh, they, they were just uh, um, associating to the dream uh, with their own uh, fantasy. And, and uh, I feel more and more uh, that it's uh, important to have this ground structures from Jung and the archetypal and, and uh, fairy tales. It, it feels uh, like uh, it's, it, it, uh, it resonates to my body when I, I, I have got, uh, I have been listening to your YouTubes, Craig, uh, for uh, half an hour, for half a year. And, and, then, and then I had a, a have different experience. No, it's too hard. Oh, it's too, too that. <laughs> and, and finally, I'm trying to to participate. I'm very glad that it's so. It's such an open. Disc, uh, it's a, so much openness and on a personal level and um, the generosity to to share literature. I, I'm so impressed by um I, I i think it just have to be at this level so people can take it to them themselves i have been trying to to listen to other um, um jungian youtubes and uh, there is much more of uh, just uh, education over over power and and so on this is power with level I, I like so much and um, this generosity that people share from their authentic life and so on so thank you we're all we're all learners and you know i uh i that's the whole idea is uh, to me it is not uh we we don't um you, you know, you know, we need our own seed to flower, and that that yes. none of us are adequate for that. So we're all learning. Thank you, Ava. It's beautiful. That was great, Ava. I really, I really like that. Uh, Diane, do you have a comment? Oh, Eva. It's Eva. So. Uh, Um, this is Diane. I, I don't really want to uh, speak much today. You know, I told you about the personal myth I wrote, and I haven't had a chance to look for it. And my grandchildren are here today, but it's just, uh, Eva, I just 
really agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, so I second your emotion, <laughs> your emotion. Mm -hmm. That's all for today. Great. Uh, Charles, do you have a comment? Um, I don't know. I kind of took something away from this that um, actually uh, impacted me pretty profoundly. Um, and I think it's going to uh, kind of change my course pretty drastically. Um, I don't exactly want to speak about it right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so yeah, sorry for being very vague, but. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. And it's like, you know, what, what could be a better outcome? So thank you. You know, actually, I want to circle back to a Zen and Angelique in case you have, you know, additional comments, because initially you just commented on the one question. Yeah, I just want to share something that I read yesterday, but um, the astrology of this time. And it was interesting that um, it said this is a time to separate past from uh, something else. But that was the... Uh, exact word that they use and past i think it's um it shows you where the root of the infection where the problem is there and i think this is um a really interesting time astrologically and um i just um signing in a course um in gypsarian society um, this is a really, really interesting course, and I don't understand um, like 70% of it. I'm just like looking, people talking, I'm looking, what are they saying? It's a completely different world. But what they say is that at the beginning of the century, 20th century, Gebser was a really interesting character. He was friend to Picasso, Jung, most of the people in. Uh, uh, what was the name of that group? Um, Iranus. He was a uh, friend to all of them. And his theory says that our time, our structure of consciousness is um, integral structure of consciousness. So everything from the past is coming to us. And uh, it started with two world wars. And um, he escaped from his apartment like within tw two hours, his apartment was bombed. And then another time he escaped uh, Spain and 12 hours later, the place that he was was bombed. So he was just, is a really, really interesting character and uh, genius really. But um, what this group and this course is studying is how to integrate, how, how this time, how we are understanding time and um, we are reading this book, uh, The Ever-Present Origin from uh, Gebser. It's the only book that is uh, translated from him. And not many people know him in uh, English speaking countries, but he's really, really a character. It's, it's a must know. And a part of this integration is this separation. You have to separate, you have to separate. And, um, this is a great time for integration when the chaos is happening everywhere. And um, if there is a psychological sin is getting stuck. And as Jung says, um, if you don't grow psychologically, you will die. I don't remember the exact quote, quote but what, that's what he says. And I think the whole thing, the, uh, Getting rid of repetitive patterns. What is, this is what ego is, repeating. Repeating old patterns. And dying in that sense means stop. Stop the old pattern. And that's how you become alive again. So I think um, this whole process is separation, integration, it's all about becoming alive again. 
This is my understanding. And in order to do that, of course, you have to face death. I want to say something um, connecting to fairy tales again about death and life, because the passive collective uh, nowadays uh, fairy tale level is so low, it's the hex and not something in detail. And it was first when I read Vasalisa, I could take uh, the symbol as some in some kind of liberating way, because uh, Baba Yaga was at first just liberating for me yeah, with the humor, <laughs> her, her house standing on, on chicken uh, legs and so on. <laughs> and, and it was so, uh, it makes the fairy tale alive, alive for me. Okay, that's all. Enjoy. Did you have any more? Um, yes, a couple of things. The, the one is about the mortar and the pestle. Um, there is this archaic um, idea presented by um, of, of the Eleusinian mysteries long before uh, in their archaic form, um, where there is this suggestion that the music of the mysteries was initially created um, because of the hitting of a kind of a pestle on a drum, the drum that was intended to have the wheat in it. So many civilizations like the Assyrians, um, similar to the Greeks, would have this ritual of grounding um, the seeds um, in a kind of a rhythm, steady rhythm of the Great Mother. So the pestle for Athanasakis, he's a professor at the University of California, is that the pestle uh, represented the masculine king, the, the masculine side of the union, uh, the king of Eleusis, and um, the, 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 um, the drum, um, was Baubo, um, his wife, the queen. So their meeting was the union of the feminine, of the opposites really, that would produce uh, what would make the tribe survive um, in the form of music. So that's, that's an idea I love about how music uh, of the Eleusinian mystery started. Um, and it seems that Baba Yaga is holding um, a sacred union within herself. Um, another thing, but I can't find now in, in, in the fairy tale where it's meant, there is something about the fire she gives to Vasilisa. Um, and I think I found this a very moving moment. She gives some of her fire, like the inner fire, like the fire of Kundalini. Uh, to the ones who get to have a true meeting with her. And it's a mystical way of giving, um, which cannot be repeated again. Um, I, felt that, I felt that was really moving, a moving moment for me in the story. Thank you. Thank you, that was, that was wonderful. Anyone else have any further comments? I have a question, but it's off topic, so I'm... Go ahead, Dahlia. Because I, I was wondering, do you know any like fairy tales where the fool or the joker becomes the king? Fool or the joker? Well, um, I, 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 I can't name them offhand, but that usually is who becomes the king because, uh, you know, it's the fool with his animal helpers, and there's a million of them. I'll find you one, but he's, you know, you know, the two king's sons, the favorite king's sons, Azim, you seem to know him. Yeah, there's an ancient um, Middle Eastern myth. And in Iran, we call, we call this guy um, Mira Nuruz. Nuruz means the new year and Mir means king. So in a tradition, they found the 
full of the village and they put him on a donkey. And for two, three days, he rules. Whatever he says, every, everybody has, has to obey. On third day, um, they start, um, they beat him. They take him, take him off the donkey and they beat him. And there are so many variations of this tradition. It goes to, it's, it's, a, it's a long story. It's a long um, thread of myths, but um, on top of my head that came to my mind. That, just a, one really quick thing. In, in early society, you know, that book, The Golden Bough, you know, uh, by, uh, uh, I forget his name, but Burroughs or somebody, but- Fraser. The, yeah, Fraser, Fraser. Fraser, George Fraser. Uh, the idea was the, uh, it was originally titled, The King Must Die. And the idea was the king was to always be that one who brings uh, bounty to the uh, to the group, you know. And so the fool who comes in and takes out the Senex king and his two sons, you know, is this renewal or refreshment from nature because he does it with his uh, animal helpers, you know. And uh, uh, so the idea is the group needs, uh, they're not so wedded to the king himself, they're represented to the, and, and you know, I, I was gonna ask you, Angelique, too, uh, the idea of the Eleusinian mysteries that um, concentrate on this this vegetative aspect of, of the grains and this uh, sense of renewal and the idea that that the seeds uh, are uh, represent um, the dead that that um, are, I, and we're going to talk about that in lecture eleven. So maybe next time you can tell us a little bit about uh, the grain mysteries of the Eleusinian and uh, how it has to do with the fool uh, or this, uh, this fool the, that with his nature, his, his nature helpers uh, uh, can lift the curse, cure the enchantment of a, uh, a Senex world that is frozen in ice. You know, the only way that it can, uh, it has to have this constant sense of renewal and refreshment. Now we have lost that, but the idea in, in Fraser's The Golden Bough was that if, uh, and, and the idea of all these, uh, these uh, Stonehenge and all these New Grange and everything was that um, is this, there must be a constant renewal, constant, uh, 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 you know, refreshment of the ruling principle. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, it's just a, uh, uh, that was kind of their, their opinion of the, God, of the king is that he need to represent the, the spirit of constant renewal. And in wolf packs, you know, every five years, there's a new alpha leader or something. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, anyway, does anybody else have any comments or about anything? Next, next time we'll start with the very, uh, uh, so probably her most cosmic writings in uh, lecture 11 and lecture 12, but there, we'll try to boil it down to so we can understand it, but it's uh, very ontological. <laughs> I was high on that chapter for three days. Yeah, I know. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, try to boil it down so we can all <laughs> get, oh. if, if it takes me four or five. I, I have to actually write it out by hand before I sometimes really get it, you know. But anyway, so well, thank you, everyone, and we will uh, we'll start with the lecture lecture eleven next time. I think we yeah. we just got lecture eleven and lecture twelve, and then we'll start about uh, ask what we want to do with the next uh, session. I was just going to ask, is in could you send out to the group, uh, you know, like a link for that book? Or and maybe the yeah that integration sounded interesting. Uh, the written I don't know a specific book, but I can send you the mess. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Okay. Bye, bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, bye.